Hello, and welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm Mike Dever, founder of Brandywine Asset Management and host of today's show. My co-host is Dan White of Daniel A. White & Associates. And our guest today is R. Brent Byrne, president and CEO of DiviVest Advisors. Well, hello there, Dan. Hey, do Mike. Hey, um, very good, thank you. And um, maybe a little better than what I see happening in the stock market. Um, <laughs> it's been uh, a, a tough year. And I, so I have some questions. Um, what does a recession in 2023 mean for retirees or people near retirement? Obviously, it's, it's a, been a challenging 2022. Um, what does it mean still now going forward? I mean, it really has been a tough year. Uh, when you look at the beginning of the year, we hit the all-time high on January 3rd, I believe, the S&P at the all-time high. And and then inflation got out of control and the Fed tried to tell us it was transitory and, and that kind of went by the wayside and they've been hiking rates ever since today. I see they went up a half a point instead of three quarters of a point. Um, but the concern is that they're going to kick us into a recession, you know, that they've hiked uh, the, the rate hiking cycle has been faster really than anything in history than what we've ever seen. And we've had an inverted yield curve all year you know, where the two-year treasury is paying a lot more than the 10-year, and that has a pretty accurate predictor of a recession. So if we go into a recession in 2023, uh, unemployment's probably going to go up. Uh, you can probably expect more volatility in the markets. Uh, the bond market might stabilize a little because, the, you know, at some point, we hope, they'll be done hiking interest rates. <laughs> you know, they're... Yeah. They've gone from three quarters of a point to a half, but they're still going up. So uh, that's not good for the bond market. Um, if you're near retirement, I mean, I think that's really what it always boils down to is how much time do you have before you're going to need your money? So if you're near retirement at or near retirement within three to five years, you got you got to play a little more defense. You got to be a little more cautionary because if you're if you lose, you know, if you blow a motor on the last lap of the race, you're not going to finish the race. And that's what we worry about with retirees. So what do you, um, well, I guess a couple of questions came out of that. You know, the, the first is, um, does, the, does the Fed know what they're doing? <laughs> uh, you know, the fact that they totally missed the call on inflation. Yeah. Um, when I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was taught in Econ 101 that, you know, too much money chasing too food, few goods is going to produce inflation. And Obviously, with the trillions and trillions in stimulus coming through the COVID, you know, crisis, you, you saw a lot of, a lot of money chasing goods, um, and then th with the, the rate rising, can we? Are you confident that they've got a handle on this inflation now, and that? Yeah, where do you where do you stand? Question. I don't I don't have a lot of confidence in the Fed whatsoever. I think most of our financial crises are self inflicted. I mean, going back, going back to the dot-com bubble and the, and the housing bubble, you name it. I mean, most of the time, it's the Fed made some bad moves. They either kept interest rates too low for too long, and that's exactly what happened here. They should have been raising rates probably a year or two before, you know, before they did. I mean, and, and in hindsight, I agree 100% with you. This, this was all self-inflicted again. You, uh, you know, yeah, we had the pandemic. They ran to the rescue. That's great. They took interest rates to zero. But then the massive amounts of stimulus they, they sent out to people. And in addition, they're saying nobody can leave their house. Yeah. <laughs> so we give you all this money, but you can't spend it. And, that, and then they open up the doors. And like you said, you got too many, you know, way too many dollars chasing way too many goods. Inflation skyrockets. And now they're, they're backpedaling saying, uh, how do we how do we get the the inflation genie back in the bottle? Uh, easier said than done sometimes. So, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of confidence they're going to nail this thing. That's soft landing. I wouldn't bank on it. <laughs> OK, that was going to be my next question, because uh, rates are rising. And as they and, and, and so they rose a little less today at the Fed meeting, than they have been raising them, whether the Fed should be in charge of interest rates or not, not it's another question. But um, so with rates rising, what can we expect to see then from inflation or from the, the stock market? Um, I mean, inflation is starting. I mean, you know, the Fed's target is 2%. Well, we're at 7.1. We're not even close. Um, and the problem with the rate hike cycle that they're doing, we know it takes time. 
it takes time for these rate hikes to really have an impact. And will they overshoot it? Will they drive us into a deep, deep, deep recession? Um, very possible. You know, that's mm-hmm. the concern is that they, you know, they're, they're kind of, at the same time they were raising rates, what were they doing? They were, they were selling off some of their, some of their bonds at the same time, six billion a month. Well, they've, yeah. never, they've never done both things at once. So they're kind of, they're kind of flying the plane, you know, with, well, we never tried this before. <laughs> right. And so you start seeing a reduction in money supply. Um, you know, there's it, everything went from massive tailwinds, wins in liquidity to constraint and, and illiquidity. Yeah. Uh, everything, almost overnight. That, everything that drove the market higher, they have cut back. They have completely yeah. reversed. So there, there is no tailwinds for the market. And, you know, if, if the, again, they're still raising rates. It's not like they pivoted and they're starting to cut them at any point. Uh, they're still raising them. So and, and you think about the debt that the country has, not only the country, but corporations. Corporate debt is very high right now. And now you're replacing a zero percent interest rate with maybe a five percent interest rate. I mean, right. Something's yeah. got to give, and it's probably going to lead to layoffs and unemployment, and probably probably a recession is coming. So, well, then what do you do then? The people that are at that retirement, people like to say, you know, the retirement red zone, for example, you know, just heading into retirement or or recently in retirement. You talked about being a little more maybe conservative. What what does that mean specifically? That they shouldn't be buying Tesla and Zoom stock, I guess. Uh, well, I think they should have got out of Tesla and Zoom a while ago. Peloton yeah. and GameStop and <laughs> you name it. Well, um, GameStop, you can't you can't lose from what I can see in that. I mean, every every year it seems like we have another meme meme bubble that takes place. Yeah, and they're mm-hmm. usually the first things to go, and then it then it leaks into your blue chips and everything else. So mm-hmm. um, our philosophy has always been. You know, you got to nail down the income. If retirees have enough income, whether it be through Social Security, pensions, annuity products, if you've got the amount of guaranteed income, then then you have other money that's in the market invested. As long as you're not relying on the market, the money in the market for your income, hey, it will come back eventually. But if you're relying on on money in the market to provide you with that income, you might have problems. So it's all about locking down that income first. Yeah, you don't want to be doing your four percent a year withdrawal and having it be turned into eight percent because the market's down fifty percent. Exactly. Uh, yeah, like Morning Stars, you know, came out uh, just recently last year. They knocked it down under three. The four percent rule went to under three, and now they raised it a little bit. But bottom line is, they're telling you with the volatility we're seeing, you might not be able to pull as much from a, a market-based portfolio as you could in the past. And one last quick question, and we, we are running out of our time here, but um, health care, another big expense, uh, not just for retirees, but everybody. Um, are there any good solutions to help hedge the cost of that, especially I, I relating think, to long-term care? Yeah, we see that a lot, especially with retirees. Long-term care, mm-hmm. the concern there is people are getting uh, letters in the mail, you know, hey, your premium's going up on your long-term care. You can either raise the premium or cut the benefits. One of the alternatives with that is they have these hybrid type annuity products where it's kind of like a three for one. If you put in, say, two hundred thousand dollars into the annuity, you might buy yourself six hundred thousand dollars of long term care benefit. So it, it kind of solves it solves the inflate, you know, the inflated cost because it's a one time lump sum in there. But the other thing that it does, it, it, it the the objection that people have to long term care is what if I never use it? So if I'm paying five, six, seven hundred dollars a month for long-term care, and I never go into a nursing home, I've kind of thrown that money away. Here, when you do but it, the other shouldn't, way, shouldn't you be grateful of that? And in, in any oh, case, yeah. though, but yeah. yeah, you don't buy it hoping you're going to use it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like buying right. homeowners insurance and hope your house burns down. No, you know? exactly. <laughs> but but you you said there's still an upside with this policy. There is because uh, uh, if you do the annuity route and you put in your two hundred thousand, I mean maybe it's growing at two three percent a year. Um, and if you never use the long-term care, you name a beneficiary for the annuity and it passes on to your kids, your, you know, beneficiary. Okay. So. I, we do have an audience question here. Dale Zelnick of Marion is asking, what's the average yearly return on growth mutual funds versus income funds? Well, I, lo- I love the term average. I mean, are we talking, uh, are we talking 2022? Uh, the averages yeah. are pretty negative, but uh, over long periods of time, I think on growth mutual funds, you should be looking into 
seven to seven to nine, eight to ten range, and income funds are probably going to be somewhere between the three and five, four to six range. That would be your long-term averages, of course, in any given year. There could be volatility and you could have negatives. As we're seeing this year. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, and now if you're interested in uh, asking a question on Money Matters TV, here's how you can send in your questions. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com welcome back we'd like to introduce uh, our guest today uh brent Byrne, who's president and ceo of divivest advisors hello brent how are you thanks for having me thank you you're very welcome um tell us a little bit about divivest uh divivest was founded in uh, 1990 and um we uh, started uh, managing money uh, January 1st, 1991. We offer two stock portfolios. Uh, we specialize in stock portfolio management. Uh, one is a uh, blue chip account, and uh, one is an all cap portfolio, investing in small, medium, and large companies. Um, so the um, the funds of both, are they funds or they manage accounts? What do you- uh, Separate you accounts. Uh, separate uh, accounts. Linked, linked together. And what would be like uh, a minimum investment amount that somebody would have to pay? Half a million. Half a million. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, very good. Thank you. So, yeah, so Brent, quick question. So you're, you're managing as the stock portfolios. As you said, you have your blue chips and then you have your, uh, you know, your cap accounts. What's your, what's your investment strategy? I mean, how do you decide um, uh, what's your criteria for which stocks to buy and sell? How do you, how do you do the selection process? Uh, the the first would be a um, we we want to narrow down the universe of stocks to stocks that are paying above three percent current yield. So that narrows greatly down the uh, universe of stocks that we uh, pick from. Next, uh, we want to not only get a, a stock that pays at least three percent. But we also want to find stocks that can grow their dividends maybe 10 to 15 percent a year. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, we have other screens, uh, for, you know, that would complement, uh, you know, a greater fundamental uh, view of this, the stocks that we're looking at. So it almost, so this, it almost sounds ahead, like the, perhaps the dividend aristocrat, you know, where they're increasing their dividends every year. Well, our key is we, we want to find companies that are able to grow their dividends. And, mm -hmm. you know, to that extent, you're, you know, getting involved in some guesstimating. Uh, and there's sources that we can look at to get a, a, a increase our chances of getting into those types of stocks that are likely to grow their dividends. But initially, we want, want to lock in at least a 3%. The the idea is that if you got three percent and a stock growing twelve percent a year of dividend, that's fifteen percent target total return, uh, which uh, yeah. at one point we were averaging over that, <laughs> which wow. was pretty good. That's yeah, how how how's your performance been uh, looking through the uh, bear market? Well, this year we're uh, about flat in the uh, blue chip account, and we're down starting the day about eleven percent versus 15% for the S&P 500. So we're doing pretty good. Um, yeah. And we're, we're taking advantage of, of, of uh, you know, the low prices, you know, that we're being afforded. Okay. So you're able to buy in at uh, more favorable dividend yields really now, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's some great names out there. And, um, you know, <clears throat> in bear markets, we usually outperform. You know, that's the okay. whole uh, value approach, you know, which is the yield uh, uh, approach we use. Uh, so, so before you came, you came on, Dan and I had a conversation about uh, what the recession means for retirees and, and 
people in that red zone of retirement. And it seems like, would that be a recommendation is uh, some of the dividend stocks would be good for retirees? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, my basis is if, if inflation's at 7% and taxes are another, you know, 30% of your income, uh, you're losing money if you're going into fixed income right now at four or five percent. You're you're going backwards. So I think from an investment investment standpoint, you need to target at least ten percent. You need to grow your money ten percent a year uh, to make any money after taxes and inflation. Uh, the equities give you that 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 opportunity. In, in, in right. Greater investment scheme of things. You can make ten percent over time, and uh, you'll retire very happily. You know, at, at that number. Yeah, I, I've argued with people, not argue, but had discussions with people over the last decade that said, "Well, I've got it. You've got to diversify your portfolio. You've got to have forty percent bonds, whatever the number is." And you ask <laughs> them what their target return is, and they're saying, "Well, I'd like to make ten percent." Well. If you're putting 40% of it in something that's making 2%, that, that, doesn't that math just tell you what you're going to need well, to make? Yeah, yeah into that it. international emerging markets, all this stuff. Uh, diversity, it, diversity from my standpoint means uh, lackluster performance. Lackluster it, 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 right. It depends on how you run it. But in that case, it, even, even, they, even they factoring need, in bear markets uh, like 2008 right. and 2009. Uh, you know, factor in all that. We've averaged over 10 percent a year since 1996. Nice. Uh, uh, with what I do. Um, but the, the yield when you're you're investing in high yield stocks, they're, you're <coughs> targeting low price stocks, stocks that have already run amok. And yeah, so so the, the universe is you're investing in stocks that are low in price, theoretically. And then when they go up in price, the yield falls back down and then you sell and then get back into the, another high yielding stock. It's sort of like the dogs of the Dow type approach, if you're familiar with that. But uh, mm -hmm. I have an all cap portfolio, which goes beyond that uh, into medium and small stocks. So you're diversified, you know, from a market cap standpoint, okay. as well as industry. So, uh, Brent, quick question. So Mike and I were talking earlier and <laughs> I know I asked you the same question he asked me. So with the Federal Reserve um, hiking rates and creating this, you know, this inflation issue and now trying to put it put it back in the bottle. Um, you know, what's what's your outlook for 2023? Is the Fed going to overshoot this and kick us into a pretty deep recession? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I hope they don't. Um, it's very likely they could. Um, the funny thing is raising rates is actually inflationary. Uh, the country runs on debt. The government runs on debt. If you raise the cost of debt, it, it's inflationary by definition. So I don't really buy the whole idea that you raise rates and you, you contain inflation. Uh, you, you can raise rates so high that you throw the economy into a recession, which Take, takes aim at inflation, uh, like, right. you know, we had with the Volcker years. But mm -hmm. uh, for next year, uh, I see inflation uh, remaining with us, maybe at not a blistering pace at the 9% rate we had earlier this year. Uh, but uh, once the genie's out of the bottle, it's hard to put it back in with inflation. Absolutely. And uh, so I think it's safe to say that we're going to have inflation and high rates throughout next year. Yeah. Um, and so if that scenario plays out, what should investors be doing? Um, how should they be positioning their investments to for, over the Buy next? high dividend yielding stocks. Uh, the, the pharmaceuticals look good. Uh, the food companies like Kraft Heinz is very attractive. Uh, pharmaceuticals like Pfizer and Gilead Sciences look terrific. Uh, each of those are paying 3% yield. Uh, the Kraft Heinz is paying a little bit more. Uh, the, the good thing about businesses, which stocks are, is that it, if inflation rate goes up 5%, they raise 7% of their prices. They, they, they not only account for the 5% underlying 5% inflation, but 
they want to earn a little extra on top of it. So you kind of have an inflation hedge with stocks, mm -hmm. at least dividend paying stocks. I, I, I guess as long as people continue to buy the products, right? If they, I, I'd, I'd stay away from bonds in a, in a, in a raising rate. You know, I, I understand there's an inversion in the 10 year, everybody's betting on lower rates and cuts right. and, and so forth. But, um, you know, you can get absolutely get murdered in bonds. You know, if uh, the, the, the idea. Well, we're, we're seeing that this year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, bond index, I mean, they were down 20%. Right, right. And uh, unless you expect, expect inflation to drop. Uh, but, you know, once inflation get, gets a little momentum to it, it's, it, it, it just doesn't turn on a dime that quickly. Do you, do you, uh, do you, do you not believe then the, the numbers that we're seeing now? It seems like in the just over the last month, people are starting to think we did turn the corner. We're, we're, we're not um, in that high inflationary regime and it is coming back in. It well, is. you know, the difference with the, 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 what Powell has done, uh, the, he's raised rates blist at a blistering pace compared to what Volcker and Greenspan did. Uh, yeah. they're, they're raising at three quarters of a point a, a pop. Today, we got a half point uh, increase. So we really don't know, uh, you know, how that, uh, that, uh, that map is going to play out. Uh, we're, we've gone through, you know, previous cycles where they would raise a quarter point every quarter, every month, but three quarter points, <laughs> it's hard to say what's going to happen. Uh, right. It could shock us into a deflationary, uh, you know, pattern. It's difficult to say, but. Yeah, and as Dan pointed out earlier, there's, there's, a, delay, there's a lag. You know, so Pal, we, well, we might is, not know for certain. Yeah, Pal is going on record. Uh, Pal is going on record as saying his biggest concern is not doing enough. You know that once we see it start to go down a little, oh, we got it under control and we and we could stop. So he's determined to kind of slay the inflation dragon. And and we talked earlier thinking the Fed kind of always overshoots and messes this up. But one other question I have for you, Pat, yeah, sure. you're talking about sectors i mean our current administration is doing nothing to support the energy sector i mean they want to go green 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 um do you think there's opportunities in the energy sector in 2023 uh well i just sold out of my exxon at uh, 111 after buying it at 42 uh, so can't go wrong you know, there but but i I like a company called Petrobras. you know it's the largest uh, oil company in brazil in latin america Paying a blistering yield. Um, it's a $9 stock today. It's going to pay at least 7% dividend. If you like energy uh, and you can stomach the political uh, <laughs> issues with, with Brazil, which are going on right now in the government, uh, I like that a lot. Um, they've paid back to shareholders $6.50 this year in dividends, and that's on a $10 stock, $10, $11 stock. Um, that, uh, I like, uh, I don't think we're in the uh, 1970s type environment for oil where you have embargoes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think oil is going to be with us in natural gas for many, many years to come. Uh, but I would keep a good eye on, uh, how quick the EVs, uh, get sold out into the public. Uh, because 50% uh, of uh, oil and gas is tied to the combustion engine. <laughs> so if EVs take over, which would, it seems like they will, uh, oil could be uh, less and less attractive over, over time. But I think for the next few years, sure, a, a, great, a great opportunity. But I would look at uh, a stock like Petrobras before I would Exxon and Chevron. And, and I'm guessing just the, the political environment is actually playing into your favor. If you're trying to buy those, you're getting depressed prices, maybe higher yield because of that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. There's absolutely uh, fear, you know, in, in Brazil uh, with the new uh, president that took over. But uh, there are safeguards that were built in uh, to these state-owned co oil companies, companies in Brazil. So hopefully they hold. And uh, we don't have a repeat of what we had a number of years ago with Petrobras. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, on an 
Unrelated topic. So I, I, I see you're championing a deceased Philadelphia painter, uh, Leonard Nelson. Now that's uh, where you tell us about that. Real mind. <laughs> is, is that right? It, tell, yeah, tell me about that. Possibly. Well, he, he discovered the next aesthetic past abstract expressionism with Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko, and it's called the in-between genre. Uh, you have realism at one extreme and you have abstraction at the other extreme. Well, he, he dwelled in the middle, and he was the first painter uh, to paint it. And actually, he founded it painting alongside Pollock and Rothko in the 40s before he moved back to Philadelphia. Uh, and then took on a teaching uh, career at Moore College of Art for 30 years. But uh, he broke out in 1974. So he showed in the 40s at Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century with Pollock and Rothko and all these greats. But uh, it took him 25 years to arrive in 1974. And he arrived in this genre, which first spread to other painters in Philadelphia. And then a trip to New York and London, and now it's painted all over the world. But he's not, he hasn't had a show, a museum show. So you can buy him relatively cheap, hmm. uh, relative to his contemporaries, which trade in the hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars per painting. You could, you could buy him, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, oh. Okay. Art, so art is, a real, is a real investment. Uh, with a long, terrific track record of, of higher and higher prices. Yeah, absolutely. I've had a, uh, I have a, a, a friend, he's, he's, he's died, unfortunately, uh, of cancer a number of years back, but he had a magazine called Apollo that he would publish. And he was also a big collector of art and a dealer in art. And his comment to me was that art is the most illiquid, inefficient market in the world. And he loved, he <laughs> yes. loved it from that standpoint, that you it can is. arbitrage you know, and make money in it uh, much more easily than you could trade in stocks. or. Well, it is. And, and you don't buy it for investment. You, you buy it because you like it first off. Uh, so you have to like the art because, you know, you're probably going to live with it for the rest of your, your life if, if you like it and hang it in your, in your, in your living space. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I've also <laughs> met people, <laughs> some of the wealthiest people I've met have been art collectors. You know, yeah. it's just a it's just a tremendous uh, medium, and um, but it's a unique situation. Leonard Nelson, uh, he's a Philadelphia artist, but he but he was a um, first generation New York school artist, which are the abstractionists from the '40s. He was a beatnik. Yeah. Uh, so he has the uh, provenance, uh, uh, you know, working with him, but he really discovered a whole new genre. And uh, it's increasingly uh, becoming popular and painted all over the world. And uh, once, once he gets his show, I don't know whenever that will be, well, but uh, well, it would be opening up a, uh, a real Pandora's box for him. And if, and if people want to learn more, I see uh, the, the website's uh, www.leonardnelson.com. Nelson they can go there and, and see that. Yeah, and do okay. your own due diligence. Yeah, all sure. right. Well, that's great. Well, I, I, I appreciate your, 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 uh, your time with us, Brent, and uh, sure. your insights. And uh, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, you. Our, our next guest on Money Matters TV is Peter M. D. Batiste. He's MD CEO of Prolocor Inc. Thank you for watching Money Matters, where your money matters.